Her lines were sleek and powerful. She was designed to kill, to seek out and destroy an enemy bomber. She was the most advanced, the most sophisticated weapon of war conceived and built in Canada. She was the Arrow. That was over 20 years ago. On a February day in 1959, the conservative government of John Diefenbaker canceled the Arrow program after five of the aircraft had flown. Today, there are no Arrows, only models, pictures, blueprints, and a few broken parts in a warehouse in Ottawa. And there is film of the Arrow in flight, smuggled out of the Avro aircraft plant near Toronto in defiance of a government order to destroy not just the plane, but seemingly all evidence of its existence. After 20 years, the Arrow is still remembered, and the questions remain. Why was it really cancelled? And why did the government wish to eradicate its memory? The tragedy of the Arrow, like so many tragedies, began in hope and optimism. At the end of the war, Canada was in a position to become one of the world's leading manufacturers of aircraft. The A.V. Rowe Company, formed in 1945, was a symbol of faith in the future. We had been building Lancaster bombers for war. Now we would build both commercial aircraft for peace and fighters to protect the peace. The architects of this policy were a canny Canadian cabinet minister, C.D. Howe, and directors of the British aircraft firm, Hawker Sidley. Among them, Sir Roy Dobson, the hard-driving Lancashireman who had virtually created the Lancaster bomber and who now became Avro's first president. The company's first general manager, here on the right, was an impatient young Canadian, Fred Smy. Avro brought together a talented team of young designers and engineers, many of them from England, like James Floyd. The age of the jet was beginning. But before the tragedy of the Arrow could unfold, another disaster was in the making. In 1946, the company embarked on its first project, a four-engine passenger jet which they hoped to sell to Trans-Canada Airlines, later known as Air Canada. TCA was intrigued by the idea of being the first North American airline to offer a jet service. Intrigued and perhaps frightened. They were troubled by the jetliner. They didn't think they could make a profit on it and eventually withdrew their support. The company then tried to market the plane in the United States. There was a triumphant publicity flight to New York, carrying the world's first jet airmail. And the New York Times said, Uncle Sam has no monopoly on genius. Now, national airlines ordered four of the aircraft with an option on a further six. It was too late. The Korean War had started and C.D. Howe ordered Avro to put its whole production effort behind a new fighter for the RCAF. Howard Hughes leased the plane for six months and used it as a personal toy. In 1957, the same year Boeing captured the market with its 707, the jetliner was broken up into scrap. Between the jetliner and the Arrow, there was one success story, the CF-100. In 1949, Avro had begun work on a new fighter. The National Film Board chronicled its birth in screaming jets. Behind locked doors, Avro Canada worked to fill a top priority order from the Air Force. And now the reps are coming off Canada's hush-hush night fighter, the CF-100. The CF-100 was a twin-engine, two-man, day-and-night fighter, the first built in Canada to the RCAF's own specifications. It was eventually to be powered by the company's own Arenda engines. With the failure of the jetliner, Avro were now dependent entirely on military contracts, and the stakes were high. In the expectant stillness of the hangar, the men who built the plane are tense with excitement. Each man wonders. Had they miscalculated somewhere, or will it scorch off beautifully into the sky?
behind that sleek black question mark lay years of hard work and headaches for all of us. And there were a few headaches to come. In 1951, the CF-100 was still a long way from its successful future. But it did bring into the company a handful of brilliant test pilots. Spud Potocki, a Polish air ace. Peter Kolp from Gloucester Aircraft in England. Jack Woodman with the RCAF, who came later. And Jan Zurakowski. These were to be the only four men to fly the Arrow. Zurakowski could make the CF-100 do cartwheels in the air. And one day, he even pushed it into a supersonic dive. But in 1951, another man was to have an impact on the fortunes of Avro and the Arrow. Crawford Gordon had been a protege of C.D. Howe's. At the age of 37, he came to the company as president and general manager. Together with Sir Roy Dobson, he built A.V. Rowe into a complex of 39 companies. To Sir Roy, he was like another son a son he would eventually disown. After Gordon's arrival, the CF-100 entered squadron service with the RCAF. Ultimately, Avro produced nearly 700 of them. But already, the Air Force knew it needed something that would fly higher and faster to keep pace with the new Russian bombers. And in that knowledge was born the Arrow. In 1952, Avro came up with design studies for a new Delta Wing aircraft. The CF-105 was to be a supersonic, twin-engine, two-man interceptor, capable of engaging the enemy at 50,000 feet and carrying missiles and rockets. It was a whole new concept in fighter technology, and it pushed Avro's design team into finding solutions to problems never faced before. Jim Floyd was now vice president of engineering in charge of the overall design of the plane. Problems were legion on the Arrow. Uh, we had a problem, for instance, that the wing skin temperatures at 50,000 feet, where the aircraft was to have its combat capability, were 40, 50 degrees higher than the boiling point of water. Yet inside of the wing, you had the fuel, which was cooling it down. So the differential temperature was trying to distort the wing. And we had to tailor and design the wing so that that distortion was compensated and didn't affect the aerodynamic capability of the aircraft. There were to be no prototypes. Avro was going straight into a first batch of pre-production models, and testing was elaborate. Scale models were fired by rocket into Lake Ontario to test aerodynamic qualities. The CF-105 was now called the Arrow. We had to be dead right first time. There was no flying a prototype, finding the problems on it, then reflecting the, that back into the production drawings and issuing modifications. You had to be right, and yet you had nothing to fall back on, no real experience to fall back on, on the design of the aircraft. As the program developed, there were some unanswered questions that were to have a crucial bearing on the Arrow's fate. The RCAF had not completed studies on the weapon they wanted the plane to carry. Robert Lindley, chief technician, came up with an unusual solution. Uh, one feature of the uh, Arrow, the uh, weapon bay, you may recall that the whole weapon bay would lower out of the airplane and go back in again. And I put that feature in there because I couldn't find out what weapon we were supposed to be carrying. So I said, okay, I'll solve the problem, you know, I'll make a detachable portion and take your time, make up your mind. When you're ready, we'll put it in there. And uh, it was a nifty feature, I guess, in the end, but uh, that's really why it was done. While Lindley was coping with the unknown weapon system, the arrow began to take shape on the factory floor. A workforce of some 14,000 men and women translated the engineering drawings into a reality of steel, aluminum, titanium, and miles of electric wire. And as the pace of work quickened, the liberal government of Louis Saint Laurent began to notice the mounting costs. In mid-1955, C.D. Howe told the House, we have embarked on a program of development that gives me the shudders. The RCAF had now decided it wanted the Sparrow missile and the Astra fire control system, neither of them yet off the drawing boards in the United States. The Air Force wanted the best, and it was going to cost the country dearly. But it was not the liberals who were going to pay the bill.